Good evening. You're either watching or listening to Redwood Wonk. Uh, my name is Eric Kirk. I'm with David Frank. We are talking national political news of the day. And we are going to start with the question, is Donald Trump broke? Um, you know, there's been a lot of speculation over the years after promising for months in 2016 to do what every other presidential candidate of a major party had done for decades um, to to provide his uh, personal tax information for the public to review. He refused to do it. Um, he has never revealed it. And a lot of it, speculation was that maybe he was hiding loans from the Russian mob or maybe he, um, you know, it, there was something improper in his taxes. But a, a lot of people have speculated that he just isn't as rich as he claims to be, uh, that he blew daddy's inheritance um, and um, and that it's actually kind of embarrassing. Well, um, in uh, in February, a New York judge ordered Trump and his co-defendants to pay more than $450 million in penalties and interest, in interest for a decade-long fraud scheme, one of the largest corporate sanctions in New York history. Um, Trump ha wants to appeal it, and he has to secure a bond for the full amount. He's tried to get out of it. Uh, prosecutor Letitia James has opposed that. Uh, disputed his claim that he can't secure more than 460 million and has threatened um, openly to go after his property, including Trump Tower, if he doesn't secure it. Um, and um, and and is opposed Trump's um, request to be able to appeal um, without posting the full amount, which uh, according to Letitia James is an extraordinary request. Unquote. Um, and, and this has led to, to questions as to whether or not um, the former President Trump is, in fact, broke. Does he have um, a, a lot of a lot of money? He has uh, recently um, initiated a family takeover of the Republican National Committee. Um, basically kicked everybody out who was in before, installed his daughter-in-law, and um, the, the concern of Republicans is there's not going to be a lot of money there for down-ticket campaigns. He's going to use that money not only for campaigns, but possibly for legal fees um, and uh, and the rest. The, the um, he may not be as rich as everybody thinks he is. Uh, you, know, you would think that a multi-billionaire, uh, granted, you know, when you talk about a billionaire, it's not always liquid cash, but you would think he'd be able to raise half a million dollars. He, of course, also has uh, E.G. Carroll's um, uh, $83 million um, judgment that he's got to deal with that he's also appealing. Um, so, Dave, what do you got to say? Um, yeah, so there's a few different um, pieces to this story. I think the overall uh, headline that I've seen around there is, is Trump broke? And so it's worth it's worth revisiting um, that he did receive, you know, back back when he ran for president the first time and, and, and we knew he held office. It was reported that he had received uh, around, you know, a little over 400 million in his life from his father. Um, but also that he racked up over a billion dollars in business losses over the years. Now, granted, some of that is strategic. He'd be the first one to tell you. But um, I think the number that he had thrown around or, or, you know, other folks had thrown around is that he was worth at one point about six billion dollars. But other people who have done research have said it's probably closer to half of that amount. And that was that was a, that was quite a, some time ago when all that was really done. Where we stand now is that um, you know post COVID commercial real estate is is uh, in somewhat of a distressful situation. While the top line numbers might be the values might be high, um, the reality is that a lot of these buildings are are you know sitting empty or half empty, not not fully empty, but much you know suboptimal uh, you know tenants uh, levels. And so the cash flow that typically would keeps them going and keeps them profitable is under stress or or direct in many ways. So um, there's a lot of pressure just on his overall ability to maintain the wealth that yeah. he has. Um, but also, we, you know, we, during the low interest rate environment that we had post COVID, um, uh, that was really difficult to find a, um, invaluable investments. So wealthy folks were chasing 
um, you know, that's called chasing alpha, looking for those returns that are hard to find in conventional investments, which led people to more and more illiquid investments. So while Donald Trump, um, you know, was in in that sort of overall economic climate, he's also known as somebody who's not particularly, um, uh, uh, what's the word, sophisticated as an investor. He kind of is impulsive. Uh, you know, I didn't make this up. It's a lot, but been widely reported. Um, right. That, you know, he invested in meat at one point. That was a bust. A university that was a bust. Different yeah. things. So just generally speaking, um, there's a lot of indications that he's not liquid, basically, is the takeaway there. So then the question is, um, you know, and I'll give it back to you in a second, but then the question is, uh, you know, how much, you know, the insurance company Chubb is the organization that was able to get him the bond for that E.G. Carroll uh, 90, almost $90 million bond. Um, and so they, they're often considered either themselves or in consortium with other investors as kind of like, you know, if, if they can't put it together for you, you probably can't get it. And and it's been reported that he was not able to, you know, like you said, I think 30 different entities have said, no, you just don't have enough liquid assets available for us to be able to give you a 500 million, $454 million bond. But more than that is that, um, you know, people have speculated that he actually needs a bond bigger than that because he needs to secure there's interest involved also over a hundred thousand dollars a day in interest on that kind of money so really it's closer you know it's not widely reported because it's a fact is a fact right the judgment was the known amount but what is unknown is how big of a bond does he really need and uh it it could be you know i think i've heard is, is in the 700 or more million dollar range and he just apparently doesn't seem to have that kind of money available or what you said he's not willing and he's actually just trying to play out the court so he's saying hey i don't have it what are you going to do about it and and he, that gives him more appeals um and then and then he could you know the drag this out all the way through as long as possible before he comes out of pocket but it's definitely putting him under serious duress and we'll talk more about the campaign costs legal costs i'm sure also uh, first, I want to correct apparently a slip of the tongue. Um, our our research team has uh, posted uh, half a billion. I must have uh, said half a million, which would be chump change even for if, if he is broke. Um, uh, but um, yes, and uh, I don't know what the judgment interest rate is in New York and California. It's 10%. Uh, so it is significant um, uh, that that it would be building. And yeah, he, he could leverage Trump Tower and other buildings, but we don't know exactly. I know Trump Tower has already got mortgages on it. That um, that one of them, which was supposed to come due in 2023, probably refinanced. So it's probably still got doesn't have a whole lot of equity on it, even though it, he managed to avoid the foreclosure. Um, but uh, but you know this go this is all very significant because it goes to his his image. That he has. I mean, one thing he has is this this persona that he's so clever that he uses the bankruptcy courts to his favor. You know that, uh, and that um, that he that he's a winner, right? I mean, and so, so far these civil uh, judgments against him haven't had a big impact on his core base. Um, and of course, you know the Democrats. It's nothing new to them. It may have um, impacted um, his favorability among independents, but probably not, uh, you know, significantly altering uh, how people who voted, how they voted in 2020. It probably hasn't had a big impact. There is a suggestion that if he's convicted in a criminal court by a jury, um, that that may have a significant impact. Uh, according to some polling, but so far this hasn't had it. But if he's actually broke and can't pay his bills, that could tend to start to have an effect on people who you know see him for his machismo, for his Iron Man uh, status. He's supposed to be able to deal with this stuff, and um, and and if it looks like he can't handle this, um, that's that's going to be an issue. Now you know, will he pull it off? Um, does he have some way uh, of doing it? And is he just being cheap and not wanting to have to pay it, um, you know, and wanting people to raise money to pay it for him? But yeah, he's going to he's going to have a hard time um, selling sneakers to to meet this debt. 
Yeah, and honestly, I think that um, it's it's been reported that he, in theory, could sell properties. But if you, to, you know, to to make himself more liquid, but he, you know, based on what we've seen over the years and the reporting, and if if you believe sort of none of what you hear and half of what you see, chances are there's a lot of leverage there, like you said, and his ownership stakes may have been diluted, and his equity may not be worthy. Um, that's why he actually came out and said the quiet part out loud that if he if he really had to, he would be selling at fire sale prices, which is something he does not want to do, I'm sure. Um, right. But but I think it's worth mentioning too, like now talking about the campaign itself, because we, you know, that machismo element that you said, that sort of Teflon Don uh, persona, but and, and, you know, the art of the deal and just the whole, you know, the Trump card thing, it's in his name, right? Like we all, You're we fired. all yeah, yeah, all that. Um, that's it's been working with the small donor base um, successfully in the past. And also, uh, you know, he has raised a lot of money from large donors, too. So we could get into the nitty gritty a little bit. But the idea is that um, he uh, had taken steps to have his daughter in law put in at the head of the RNC for a reason. And that's because this is supposed to be, uh, you know, upwards of a billion dollars Per, per candidate between you know Trump and Biden, we're talking about a couple billion dollars expected to be spent this year. So it's going to be a massively expensive uh, enterprise. And there's the question of small donor fatigue. So that's do donations under $200. Um, so supposedly Trump's uh, take last year was down about 63% compared to 2019, the year leading up to the last presidential election cycle. Um, he raised three hundred seventy eight million dollars um, back in twenty nineteen, which represented sorry in twenty twenty. He raised three hundred seventy eight million dollars in twenty nineteen. It was one hundred and fourteen million. So mm -hmm. so we're talking big money uh, that has come in over the years through for his campaign. And I would say like we, we realized in our own community that when you see online, internet, web, YouTube advertising pop up for political advertising, that's a sign that someone's spending a lot of money on ads. And I don't know about you, but every time I go online, I'm you know, on YouTube or any place else that, that has a video, I'm seeing Don uh, Trump Jr. You know, shilling for the campaign, so they are spending a lot of money right now to try to raise small cash. But more importantly, there's also a large donor problem. Um, many of the typical Republican large donors have not committed to him yet. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the people that supported Nikki Haley were threatened by him, and he said, "Hey, if you give to her, you're not welcome in MAGA. You're not going to be welcome here." But I know that tone has changed. That was just bluster because we all know he needs the money, and so in fact, he, they are organizing to do a big fundraiser. Uh, in New York, where they have Elise Stefanik in a headline, and uh, Governor Abbott from Texas, and uh, they're going to try to bring out some of the Wall Street heavy hitters who uh, can give one million dollar chunks uh, to his pack. And I'll say one more thing here, which is that um, the Trump Forty Seven Committee uh, has announced plans to split their the money they receive between the RNC state parties the Trump campaign and also Trump's leadership pack, which has already spent uh, $24 million on his legal fees. So a lot of these folks are saying, hey, I'm not going to commit because you're just going to siphon off this money to pay for your yeah. legal fees. And so there is a very real threat um, that some of the people who have come, ponied up the money for him in the past might not do so willingly. Yeah, they are. <clears throat> and they, they are definitely concerned. As we reported a, a few weeks ago, the Club for Growth is planning to drop 10 million into Texas to to prop up Cruz. They didn't expect to have to do that, but the polls are close there. That's 10 million that they don't have to drop into Ohio or Montana, where they which they really need to win uh, in order to be able to take the Senate. Um, and um, and the RNC, if the RNC doesn't have money to go to those, uh, and also to to prop up the 30 to 40 seats that they're going to need to defend to hold on to the House, if all of this money is going for for Trump's legal fees, they got a problem. Um, they've got a real problem because Trump doesn't really care, uh, or at least he hasn't expressed that he cares about it, uh, about the the down ticket. 
um, or feels that it's his responsibility, except for very few people. He backed a candidate, we'll talk about Ohio today, that that makes them less likely, not more, to take Ohio. Um, and um, and the the uh, and he's not reaching out to Nikki Haley. Um, you know, granted, she said some things, and probably that's a, a hopeless cause. Mike Pence has already said he's not going to endorse Trump. Um, they've got a, you know they've got some problems, and um, and they they need to, the Republicans. Uh, have to th to think about this, and and if the RNC money is going to be strictly Trump money, um, that you know, yeah, who's going to want to donate? Exactly, and and I think just to reinforce what you said, the fact that people who typically donate large sums of money are looking to build the party base, the candidates, you know, the state, the state, the down ticket. Uh, candidates across the board um, and, and the fear, the risk that that's going to be siphoned off for Trump's, you know, continuing legal costs, et cetera. That, that's a real sort of, uh, you know, self-reflection moment for a lot of these people. The world has several great nations, but none with the power and influence of the United States. For better or for worse, the world looks to you for the future and the future of the West is in grave doubt. We in the West have not faced a crisis like this for a long time. The ideological wars of the 20th century against the totalitarian powers of Nazi Germany and Soviet Union were terrible, but democratic West rallied and defeated them both. Now the West is at war with itself. We have seen what kind of future the globalist ruling class has to offer. But we have a different future in mind. The globalists can all go to hell. I have come to Texas. Uh, <laughs> Viktor Orban is the prime minister of Hungary. Uh, Hungary, uh, formerly a communist bloc nation, has made the right-wing nationalist turn um, probably the most extreme of NATO. Um, it, uh, he, I believe he came to power in 2010, and he has actually taken an authoritarian uh, mode of rule that has basically managed to restrict freedom of press in the country, uh, impacted the independence of the judiciary, and managed to pass laws in, that are um, homophobic um, and um, and uh, has severely restricted freedom and and put into and made the elections they hold them but they're questionable um, he is uh, he, he is attacked they are part of the EU but he's attacked the EU as anti-nationalist anti-christian um, this is a right-wing authoritarian figure who has not yet completely destroyed democracy, but it is on oxygen um, to, uh, tubes in, in there. And this is a figure who in recent years has become popular among the American right wing. Um, and uh, he is good friends with Donald Trump. Uh, he is he come to CPAC to speak. And more recently, he has uh, become buddies uh, with uh, with the Heritage Foundation. Um, there's an excellent article in last week's um, New Republic about this. Now, New Republic has been playing it down. Um, Mary, not the New Republic, sorry, the Heritage Foundation, um, when they did respond, the article has contains their responses, and they say, well, we appreciate his conservative social values. Uh, we don't appreciate his um, uh, ties to China and Iran um, and other, you know, uh, his foreign policy, but we do appreciate, um, you know, some other aspects. And to bear in mind, we have talked about Project 2025 on this show, which is also of, of origin of the Heritage Foundation. And let's also bear in mind that the basic uh, structure of Obamacare originally came from the Heritage Foundation as an alternative to universal health care or socialized medicine. Um, you know, this is a, a Reaganite 
organization, basically, that has been, um, um, I, I won't say the far right for a long time, but but the, but basically Viktor Orban seems to be the darling of the modern right wing. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of mainstream press coverage of this. Um, it's it's disturbing a few um, aspects of it. But, you know, we, we've been talking about the rise of authoritarianism against libertarianism in the American right wing, which, you know, used to have a very strong libertarian element and it's disappearing. And uh, the the ascent of uh, Orban as uh, so, you know, along with other figures like Bolsonaro and 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 the rest, who's actually facing some legal problems of late. But um, but uh, you know, what is the story here? Why is this guy a hero of the American right? Why does he keep getting invited to their conferences? And uh, and why is the American media so meek uh, about it or or quiet about it? So thank you for that setup. Uh, I just also should mention that there was a different article fairly recently in New Republic that outlined, kind of explored a little bit more about Orban's background and and kind of his rise to power in Hungary and his coalition and his priorities. Um, and and you know just to just to give the big picture, thirty thousand foot view first, uh, he's been. He pivoted as originally being um, somewhat resistive to embracing Putin as an ally. He has pivoted to being more aligned with Putin and other authoritarian leaders, much more closely aligned with China, as you said. Um, so, so he's uh, basically been cast as a little bit of a uh, shrewd strategist in terms of power and 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 the issues that provoke. Uh, loyalty for that authoritarian strain that you described, that that lane that he takes in Hungarian politics. Um, so, what what are the similarities? The the big similarities, I think, were uh, there. He, he sort of opportunistically um, was strongly against the immigration wave that basically came out of Syria yeah. into into Eastern Europe um, during the civil war there. That has you know it's. That, that immigration flows died down a little bit, but that was a huge priority. So, so number one, that taking advantage of native nativism, that opportunism, but also this anti-globalism sort of strain. Um, somewhat coincidentally, George Soros is vilified in the United States as this globalist who puts money behind um, lots of uh, different uh, NGOs and other other nonprofits and uh, democratization and and open. I think it's called. I think literally it's called the Open Institute or so. You know that I forgot the name of his entity, his donor entity. Uh, but but it's it's open society basically. That's what he promotes. And this is in Eastern Europe is where he's from. And on the, George Soros made you know billions of dollars in sort of speculation uh, currency. That's a separate issue. But the idea is that he's giving back to openness and democratization and liberalism in, in communities around the world. Well, he's from Hungary. And so if you have, if you could see a lane of people saying, hey, we're more like, you should worry about home. You should worry less about globalization and, and sort of the globalization of values the the, the, the West has, you know, proposes and, and uh, is emblematic and amplifies. When you combine that with just the overall authoritarian outlook, right? So those similarities, I think that those are strength, those are uh, elements that the that the right and the far right uh, embrace. So so there's like in the Venn diagram of political priorities. Um, you know, when you are when you are a distressed economy and there are immigrants that that uh, uh, you know immigration is an issue that is is uh, is a is a you know highly charged politically. Um, that opportunism of the Republican Party. Uh, you know, basically MAGA, right? So much of what yeah. fuels MAGA is is uh, this anti-immigration. So, so that to me, that's that's like the that's the overlap. Um, there are some differences which I think are worth mentioning. Um, that could that you know, because not everything is the same. In Hungary, um, they they have largely pro-family policies, in part because populations on the decline. So they they like give people huge breaks and incentives to have children. They need children, especially if you're going to be against immigrants. You need to have people make more children where they're not making them. And also in Hungary, um, abortion is sort of just it's an accepted thing. Uh, whereas in the United States, the MAGA folks are not handing out money anytime soon in support of family, but they say both both 
camps say, hey, we're doing this for the families. That, that's sort of from the fascist playbook, right? Is that we mm -hmm. are here to protect you, your wife, you, you know, your family structure, your children. And, and it's just us. The strong man is the way to do it. So so that's that's the big overlap. But um, there are you know, there's specific uh, 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 examples that we could talk about also. Yeah, well, I mean, it really the American media ought to make the, the Trump Orban connection as a story because the way that he has risen to power and he did have a previous run as um, as their leader in 1980, 98 to 2002. But he the way he is held power is um, the former minister of education, Balint Magyar, has stated that in elections in Hungary under Orban are undemocratic and quote unquote free but not fair due to gerrymandering and large scale control over the media and suspect funding for political campaigns. And then what's really important to understand is that the parliament is set by districts, uh, geographic, uh, kind of uh, uh, a little bit like the United States, not quite, but a little bit, um, where you've got these districts. And so under the gerrymandering in 2002, um, Orban's party won 54 percent of the vote, but 83 percent of the districts due to the gerrymandering <laughs> um, and other tweaks to Hungarian uh, election rules. I mean, it, it's um, I, I, and there's there are a whole bunch of other um, you know, I, I could go on about what he's done, but this is the model. This is what Trump wants to do. This is what Project 2025 is about is is you know they they talk about you know how the electoral college can be used and how the constitution of of um, negation can be used by the state legislatures where republicans have control they can invalidate elections and simply appoint the um uh in theory appoint the electoral college uh, people, so they they are looking at this um, at, at very simply. We can have free but unfair elections. Um, you know that that uh, where yeah, everybody yeah, sure, everybody has a right to vote. But what do, difference does it make? This is what uh, they are looking towards, and it is not being covered. <laughs> it is not being discussed in the media. We we hear about. Oh, it's a rematch between Biden and 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 Trump, and nobody likes either of them. And pox on both of their houses; they're too old. And and they both, you know, it's it's not. This isn't a, about you know two you know subpar candidates or whatever. This is this is a, a um, an election that is really about something about an existential crisis of democracy in this country. Um, and I, I, I think the media, for all its, you know, it, it claimed or, or that it's a liberal bias or whatever, is really missing the boat here. Yeah, and I think, you know, you kind of have to take people at their word when they, you know, at their words and deeds at face value. So like you had said, why, why is Viktor Orban sort of the, you know, poster child or being well so strongly embraced by by you know, Republicans, but but more so the the sort of MAGA wing, um, uh, it's it's they they are actually saying um, so they are there's a, an example in New Republic where Matt Schlapp, who's the chair of the American Conservative Union, mm -hmm. um, defended <laughs> Orban and he said yes we support leaders who reject globalism, socialism, illegal migration and care about defending families, national sovereignty and traditional values. And and even um, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson, you know, we know him to be in in Trump's orbit, also part of the mm -hmm. Stop the Steal exercise. Um, he he has publicly came out in favor of Orban's border policies, and my recollection is that he's actually built a wall there. So so that's the thing, right? If there's a guy who's saying the the same things that you're saying and and taking the same steps that you're taking, there's an affin a natural affinity. Also, Tucker Carlson, maybe people forget, but Tucker Carlson actually produced a documentary that was praising um, yeah. Orban. And and so, uh, you know, that was just a couple of years ago, not, you know, 2022. And so more importantly, though, more more of a direct connection, I think, is the CPAC itself. So CPAC has held events in Budapest. Yep. And so um, I th two of them and and they were held at the Budapest based Center for Fundamental Rights. And that's their their like claim to fame, I think, is 
They consider preserving national identity, sovereignty, and Judeo-Christian social traditions as their primary mission. So, so besides that, I mean, there's more examples too. Uh, Orban's political director, uh, who, who's actually his last name is Orban also, but they're not related. Um, he is the, um, he oversees, I'm not sure what his exact title is, uh, a, a private college, uh, Matthias Corvinius Collegium in Hungary. And they, uh, they have gotten lots of investments and they also host um, American Hungarian conservative um, conventions of certain kinds. So there's been this cross pollinization. And the reason I went through those, that was a little tedious, I know, but um, this is, if we remember, you know, Steve Bannon, uh, it was involved in uh, in European right wing politics and um, the the uh, you know, the political uh, consultancy firms, um, they they are actually selling their services around the world and, you know, including in Italy and successfully. So like now the leader of Italy was was supported by by American uh, political consultants and companies uh, and yeah. that are affiliated. Um, formally directly, but now more informally and more indirectly rather um, with, with the orbit of, of Donald Trump. So it's not just like, hey, maybe they're some patico or something, but no, actually they have strategic alliances, um, electioneering, you know, campaigning, uh, uh, activities, contracts, uh, priorities. And so it is sort of a, you know, an authoritarian or at least a non-democratic or, or, you know, uh, anti-liberal bias in in the alliance. Yeah, I, I mean, and let's also take you know it took root in a very, I'll say, conservative culture. Hungary is socially very conservative. I'm my grandfather was born in Hungary. I've 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 known family members, and uh, they they're kind of the left wing. Uh, probably one of the reasons they came to America. Um, I through twenty three in me, I learned that I am three percent. Jewish that through that Hungarian line, which means that sometime in the 19th century, somebody married into the family having to hide the fact that they were Jewish. I mean, this is, um, you know, this, this is the culture. Um, <clears throat> it, it is, uh, it, it was taken over by the Nazis, but it wasn't hard for them to adapt, uh, you know, uh, unlike other cultures. There wasn't a whole lot of resistance as there was in other countries. It was, you know, it just, um, anyway, I mean, you know, it's just the, um, the, 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 there is a history there that makes this possible. I mean, 1998, that's like not even a decade after it was lifted up from um, from the Soviet um, influence, right? I mean, it's just there hasn't been a whole lot of opportunity for it to be a free culture. It's a beautiful country. Um, they make some great food. I mean, you know, it's just, I, I mean, I love par the pap paprika and paprikash and, you know, the, the, the rest. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a personal thing here that they are, that there is so reactionary. You mentioned uh, that documentary, Jordan Klepper of um, of the Daily News, uh, the co comedian, also took a trip over to Hungary and did his kind of street theater thing. Fascinating two part um, thing. Uh, I, I urge everybody to go to YouTube and find it. I'll let you close it out. Yeah, I think um, just because not everybody is fully aware, but the, you know, this quote unquote Iron Curtain that separated Western Europe from Central and Eastern Europe, the the West from from the Soviet sphere, um, that that Hungary was on the other side. Hungary was part of the Soviet states. And so they, they've only been democratized, um, you know, since like 89 ish. Right. So uh, for the fact that Orban came to power within a decade of that, um, he, you know, he he was a, like again. People give him a, has, have given him a lot of credit for being savvy strategically and kind of figuring out what people, what their wants and needs are, and and speaking to the base. Uh, it, like you said, very conservative. But so looking forward, I'll just give you this. I'll end with this one last quote here. Um, the Democracy Institute Leadership Academy for Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Susanna, I'm going to mangle her name, um, Selenia. Um, she, there's a quote from her meaning this talking about uh, Orban's party. They really hope that Trump or a Trumpist president comes back. It's important for them. Uh, then they would face more, gain more importance at the international level. They are preparing for the global rights. Oh, they're preparing for the global radical rights victory. 
So that's from within Hungary. That's the perspective on the alliance of Donald Trump and Viktor Orban. I watched a debate. It was three rich guys, three millionaires who have spent already combined more than $25 million to, shall we say, win the Senate seat. Uh, no mention of the cost of prescription drugs, no mention of manufacturing jobs, no mention of the dignity of work, uh, no mention of pensions or veterans, no mention really of how to secure the border uh, while the House of Representatives adjourned when we passed with 70 votes. Um, support for Ukraine and Israel, all of those things. So um, it was a sort of vapid debate that they made uh, back and forth. The, the one substantive thing that they did say is that they all stand with uh, national abortion ban, even though Ohio voters, as though voters by 13 points said they want reproductive rights uh, for Ohio. And so um, the debate didn't surprise me, but didn't really deal with issues that affect Ohioans every day. So Ohio has not been a battleground state uh, in terms of the presidency. I mean, kind of, uh, you know, Democratic presidents have hoped to win the state, but they haven't really been competitive there in, I think, over 20 years. Um, but they have been competitive in uh, in in Senate races. I believe the last time they won a governor's race was 2006 when Governor Strickland, a Democrat, won. But but the a Democrat um, has won. Brown Senator Brown has won. Uh, Sherrod Brown has won since 2006, and he is looking to win a fourth time. Every time the Democrats, uh, pardon me, the Republicans hope to defeat him. In 2012, they spent a whole lot of. Uh, dark money. The, the the only candidate that had more dark money spent against him that year was uh, President Obama. Um, they they really hoped to take him out, and he won with I believe about six percent of the vote. He won again in 2018 by convincing numbers. Every time uh, pundits are writing his uh, political epitaph, uh, because they say it's a, a state that is turning red, more red and more red, and uh, every time he defeats them. Um, and um, and why? Well, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you my theory is that he embraces class politics. He, he he does not carry a lot of the baggage of a lot of Democrats. He is culturally fits in well with um, with the um, voters in Ohio. He has got a lot of relationships with the unions and, and other groups. And even a couple of years ago, Tim Murphy just couldn't get that formula. He's even more conservative than Sherrod Brown. Um, but Brown has opposed trade deals. He de-emphasizes the environmental uh, issues, of course, um, not doesn't necessarily oppose them, but de-emphasizes them in his presentations. And he he's very careful how he words issues, certain issues of, of social justice. He doesn't use a lot of the typical terms, but he doesn't abandon issues of social justice. He is actually uh, more progressive than a lot of so senators in, in substantive terms, but he has um, a, um, a formula that helps him win these things. Well, he, there, yesterday there were several Republicans running for a chance to go up against him and, ho and, and have their hopes to defeat him and the the main what what has been called the mainstream um candidate was um uh the uh Matt Dolan um a, a, a Republican and also the Secretary of State Frank LaRose were running uh, a couple of other people but the person who won with more than 50% of the vote was uh Trump backed businessman Bernie Moreno um, and uh, the Democrats actually helped him win by airing ads in uh, different parts of Ohio saying he's too conservative for Ohio or kind of a uh, please don't throw me in the briar patch uh, type of um, yeah, maybe a little cynical type thing. And of course, you know, a lot of pundits are saying careful what you ask for because he could win. But I think Democrats are thinking even, even if he does win, they'd rather have a kind of nutty guy in there that they can fundraise off of and talk about how crazy the Republicans are than have an effective a Republican, um, you know, for future elections. So, um, but more clearly, they want to have somebody that Sherrod Brown looks reasonable and um, and, and moderate uh, next to. Um, so, so we so we have the stage set, and Moreno 
has said some kind of crazy things. He calls Sherrod Brown, uh, Sherrod Brown a commie. Not very original, not very creative, um, but um, he has got the mega vote. Um, Ohio votes are, they do tend to vote conservative uh, and, and Republican, but they but there is an element of them that is a little bit more complicated than that. I am, um, I've got a different prediction for the end of the show, but I'm predicting uh, Sherrod Brown wins again, a fourth time. Um, but I'm going to hand it off to you. Thanks, Eric, for that setup. Um, so yeah, I think it's an important starting point uh, based on kind of the past that you uh, spelled out. Uh, that the uh, that um, rep sorry the Republican primary last night didn't happen in a vacuum, and that um, you know prior to prior to the to the uh, the election outcome, Dolan um, again, who was a state senator, he was considered the one who was going to be much more competitive against Sherrod Brown because he's more moderate in many ways, and he's an accomplished um, you know state senator. Uh, but but it turns out that uh, you know that that uh, advantage that the that he had compared to the other candidates wasn't in the mix. It wasn't it wasn't the thing that drove folks. In fact, um, the other candidate that that was a statewide office holder, Frank LaRose, he um, he was as Secretary of State. He was, sort of took ownership a little bit of the election, the special election last year that was going to raise the threshold for uh, a, a uh, proposition to become a law to make it harder for abortion to be enshrined in the Constitution of Ohio. And then they they lost that they didn't they didn't raise the the threshold. And then in the election last November, um, Ohio, uh, the state did pass that proposition, which did protect abortion rights. So Republicans had this recollection, this memory that LaRose uh, let them down. So even though he he may, you know, he was a Green Beret, like he seems like a good candidate on the surface, um, but uh, but that wasn't sufficient. Um, so between those two people combined, they didn't, um, if you just do rough math, they only barely rather, uh, it's approximately half that they got themselves with uh, with Moreno getting above a half. So clearly, I don't know if it was Trump himself or just MAGA, uh, that like that set of priorities that that sort of the, you know, the Trump wing of the Republican Party seems to be prevailing uh, really sh solidly like Trump. Trump got, I think, 80 ish percent in the primary last night, too, even though Nikki Haley and um, uh, Governor DeSantis had dropped out of the race. They still got some votes, some protest yeah. votes within the Republicans. But the idea is that Trump's solid there. And so um, I think looking at the exit polling says a lot also. Um, Moreno was basically saying, no one's going to be on the right of me. I'm going to grandstand and say as provocative things as I can. No abortions ever, anytime. And, you know, other things of that nature that 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 just kind of stoke the base and take advantage of the vitriol. Um, and so it reflected a little bit in the exit polling where um, one of the questions was, did Biden win legitimately um, in 2020? And 65% said no, 30% yes. Um, what was your most important issue you voted on? 44% said immigration, 31 economy, 11 abortion, eight foreign policy. So, so abortion is a little bit of it, a little bit of the big picture, but people said most important. And it wasn't economy, which it really typically is for people. Um, the political campaigning and the political messaging and um, that has gone out uh, by by so, uh, I, I, I don't think I've ever said MAGA so many times in one hour, but um, right. it's, a, it's shorthand for so many things. Uh, but anyway, um, immigration is such a key priority uh, for, for this set of people. And it was reflected, like I said. So the reason I go through all that was because you had mentioned, you know, Sherrod Brown. The polling right now um, shows it's really close and and for a while there uh, leading in, you know, last fall, Sherrod Brown was doing really well. It was uh, Dolan was the only one that really seemed like he had much of a chance. But now that the candidate is Moreno, um, you would expect that the polarization um, would be would play um, solidly here. And and the the most recent polling, it obviously didn't re doesn't reflect last night, but the most recent polling reflects that. The, the, the trend is going towards the narrowing of the gap. So I think this is going to be a big challenge for Senator Brown. 
Well, I've got one now. This, again, this is the Florida Atlantic University. Uh, that has Brown ahead by uh, 11, where Dolan was behind uh, Brown by four. Um, that Again, that's not a, a big poll, but East Carolina University Center has Brown over Marino by four, um, and, and Dolan was ahead of Brown by two. Um, so uh, Dolan was definitely polling better uh, among it. And then Ohio Northern University had uh, has Brown ahead of Marino by six and was ahead of Dolan by three. Dolan was definitely a better candidate for the non-Republican um, votes. Um, but if there is a Dobbs effect, um, I, I, again, there's there, there's only one poll in there that had a Republican ahead and then and not by a statistical uh majority um you know the uh, ahead and granted yeah he he's it's closer than it was in the fall but brown is still ahead um in all of the polls and if there is any kind of dobbs effect um <clears throat> it's even a, a bigger margin um the uh the, you know the the democrats i mean again the republicans probably made a mistake there in terms of their voting choices. Um, and Brown, usually the the polls are kind of close until he gets into a debate, and that's where he usually takes off. Um, he has, uh, he he comes across as personable. He, he doesn't have to attack. He's really good on the issues. <clears throat> I just don't know what, and Biden, even if he is as unpopular as all of the approval polls show, what the past couple of years have shown is that whatever his unpopularity is, it's not rubbing off on Democratic candidates, and it's certainly not rubbing off on Brown um, in the um, in, in the these polls. Um, uh, so um, I know it, it, I mean anything can happen, but you know what is what could happen. That could uh, that could lead to Moreno winning. I mean, I think something the economy would have to tank, or there would have to be a major crisis on the border. The problem with that is Brown has actually positioned himself kind of well on the border issue. Um, he has taken stands against the uh, against the trade agreements, like pretty much like Bernie Sanders has. Um, <clears throat> so you know he so he's positioned himself well, even if there are economic problems. Um, again, um, and social issues don't seem to, to win it, as you pointed out. The abortion issue is not a winner for um, for Republicans anywhere in the country, apparently. Um, and so um, it, I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what the um, what Marino's uh, winning path is. That's why I'm making this prediction. I don't really have a good one unless there's just this big red wave because something really bad happens. Um, but Brown seems to survive even that. So I think um, just listening to Brown speak over the years and look at how he votes and look at his policies, he he has sort of earned the street cred, I, I would argue, as, as um, authentic and engaged, and he shows up. Um, I actually watched uh, the Obama produced documentary called I think American Factory about a mm -hmm. Chinese factory the like a glass factory in in Ohio and he he showed up to speak and w while he was speaking the managers were talking to each other and said he's never welcome back here again the way he's talking because um, mm -hmm. he was talking about the workers basically so he even even invited to this you know basically Chinese company you know, reopening a factory. It was a big deal. Um, the Chinese uh, leadership flew in and basically said, whoever made the decision to let him speak here, like you're lucky you have a job to paraphrase. Um, so so he's 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 he walks the walk. Um, so that's that's a, a indicator that um, depends on the weather in the country, not the climate, but actually the political weather. Because Ohio is such a bellwether state and um, and I and I, uh, you know, I think it's like night over 90 percent of the time Ohio where Ohio goes in the presidential election is how the win is the winner like so they I think two out of three times they vote um, uh, Republican if I remember correctly but the bottom line is the way that they vote is the way that the country votes and so really um, it's it's going to be a, an indicator uh, of, of how the country feels come November um, who knows what where we're going to be at a time like that but 
some pundits were saying, hey, look at the turnout last night, how about half of the people showed up uh, to the Democratic primary compared to the Republican primary. Um, you know, I think it was, um, you know, a million and a half compared to like, you know, uh, three million or something like that. It was it was uh, it basically it was just about half. Right. But that's not a really great indicator um, because of the candidate mix, right? So when the, no, Republican, they, they, the Republicans had a very interesting multi-candidate yeah. race going on. Yeah, and both Democrats, Democrats ran unopposed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, out of 7 million registered voters, you know, turnout I think works out to, you know, relatively small, uh, 25% or something like that. And if you look historically, that's low. Um they 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 fluctuate in in uh, primaries. They fluctuate in generals uh, between 25 and you know as much as like 60 percent of people are, are turning out. This was a relatively low turnout, relatively low enthusiasm. I think that's going to really be quite different come the general, and so it's not a indicator of the enthusiasm level. And so other other factors we have to pay attention to uh, that'll really decide uh, this race because not only is Ohio a bellwether, it's also uh, you know, one of those states that um, could arguably really uh, determine how things uh, go on the presidential side, too. Yeah, I think um, uh, Brown, uh, yeah, and, and you're right, um, Obama did win Ohio in 2008, lost it in 2012. Um, but um, but they, but it has been a bellwether state. I don't know that it is so much anymore. Um, Biden um didn't really come that close uh, to winning it. Um, I don't think Clinton did either. Um, but um, but the um, it 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 is it's kind of like Iowa it used to be a a, a battleground state, um, and uh, neither of them have been so much uh, of, of late. Um, it, 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 interesting how states change without having big, huge demographics change like Georgia. But we will be talking about Ohio in the future. <laughs> Eeny, meeny, chilly, beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. This brings us to predictions. What do you have for us, Dave? Uh, so this one's pretty bold, and um, I, you know maybe I'm a little ahead of my skis here on this one, but there's been a lot of talk about who the vice presidential candidate would be for RFK Jr. That has has leaked out as possibly um, you know somebody who's a, a lawyer, activist, fundraiser because he needs money, and so we'll see. Apparently he's already chosen, and they and that's going to be next week. Um, so you can find that anywhere. But I'm I'm going to take a crack at Trump's vice president. Um, I think that the the margins are so small here that he's going to look for any advantage that he can get. And I think Tulsi Gabbard kind of gets him the independent vote. And um, she's a she's a veteran and she's a former Democrat and and she's got a huge national profile, uh, plus uh, brings in, you know, um, more arguably more women. I do. I do. My prediction is that that's going to be ultimately the way he goes uh, to get to get all those people who could be make the marginal difference where he needs it most rematch debate with Harris. Um, so, um, well, I am going to make another Senate prediction here. Um, today, uh, the Montana Supreme Court ruled um, by six to one that a uh, abortion uh, constitutional amendment can go onto the ballot. It had been stopped by Montana's government, and it would guarantee the right of pregnancy decisions uh, uh, up, up to certain months. I, I'm forgetting exactly what the month is, but po the point is, is that abortion is going to be on the ballot in Montana next November. Um, this is this basically hyper. Uh, accelerates the Dobbs effect when when abortion is actually on the ballot. I am pre predicting that John Tester is going to hold on, um, much like Sherrod Brown, and uh, and and will prevail in Montana in uh, in in November. And uh, without winning both Ohio and Montana, it's going to be very difficult for the Republicans to retake uh, the Senate. Um, with that in mind, we'll see if I'm right, but until then, stay informed and stay engaged. Mm -hmm.